Hi, Mark here for the Kensington Minute. Born in Newcastle in England in 1903 of Russian and German descent, his family moved to Russia several years after its civil war. By then, he had become skilled with amateur radio and piano. His native fluency in English made him very attractive for the KGB, or the NKVD, as it was called then. He served in Soviet embassies around the world as a radio transmitter. In the United States, he was an illegal. He cast himself as a part of Brooklyn's artistic community taking photographs, doing things like that. Then he was arrested and sentenced to prison in the United States, only to be exchanged for an American in 1962. Do you know who he was? Well, if you said either William Fesher or Rudolf Abel, you'd be right. You'd also be right if you said Emil Goldfuss. He had a score of aliases. If there is any background that could have prepared him for life as a KGB, he certainly had it. He was great with languages, Russian, English, German, and French. He was also very adept at radio work. And he was a committed communist. He survived Stalin's purges of the mid-1930s, which was often a matter of luck, and luck was on his side as he slipped into the United States and transmitted information about the United States to Moscow. It was 1953. A young newsboy had just finished the weekly collections from his paper route. He began to count the nickels and dimes to make sure the total amount was correct. A five cent piece slipped out of his hand to the pavement. He was astonished at what he saw. The nickel had split into two equal segments, revealing a small piece of microfilm. And the FBI G-men went to work right away. They couldn't identify the source of the coin. Who handed it, Jimmy? But a Soviet defector, Abel's predecessor in the United States, could identify the source, who was, of course, Rudolf Abel Goldfuss. But what kind of guy was this? Abel Goldfuss. Did, did you ever wonder about him, what his occupation was or anything? Well, I thought he was an artist. He dressed like an artist. What? How was that? How did he look? Well, he, most of the, the times that I've seen him, he wore a brown suit and uh, tie open, you know, shirt unbuttoned. Uh, he wasn't too talkative, the man. Only uh, if he walked into my shop, he'd sit down and talk to me about electronics, what his problems are on his radios, and so forth. And I would advise him, and he would tell me if he's doing the right thing, and I would, you know, talk back and forth with him. When the FBI searched his studio, they found a cache of communications equipment and more. There were false papers, passports, and birth certificates. So the gig was up. Abel confessed to his identity, but would not give any further information. He was tried in a federal court on three counts of conspiracy, and received essentially a life sentence. He was an artist in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, and he enjoyed playing chess and piano with the inmates. He became friendly with Morton Sobel, who was part of the Rosenberg Ring. We have a Kensington Minute on Sobel, too. But Abel was released after four years in an exchange with a U-2 pilot, Gary Francis Powers. He was a celebrity of the KGB now, and he gave lectures on living as an illegal in the United States. Postage stamps made about him, movies, interviews. Yeah. He died in 1971 of lung cancer. The movie about the spy swap was Bridge of Spies. Check it out. Abel was certainly a skilled spy, but not skilled enough to escape the FBI. He also was an artist. How skilled was he? Well, I'll let you judge. This is <clears throat> one of his sketches I have hanging in my office. Work-related, you know. But what do you think? What do you think of the man and the artist? 
we at Kensington would love to know. This Kensington Minute does not represent the official position of the United States government. Take the Kensington Challenge on our homepage. Out here.